Welcome to the AME Food Testing Show. Today's topic, the first 100 food safety interviews on the AME Food Testing Show. Welcome with me as a new co-host of the AME Food Testing Show, Dr. Carl Cobe, Chief Science Officer of the High Sierra Group. The High Sierra Group is one of the nation's largest purveyors of food safety products and services. The High Sierra Group is a composite of companies offering a wide range of accredited and acclaimed services to the food industry. It is a group of companies that are focused on the return of hard-earned investment to food providers. They are registered, accredited, and accepted throughout the industry. Dr. Cobe received his PhD from Berkeley University and is a retired U.S. Army officer at the rank of Colonel. Welcome with me, the new co-host to the AME Food Testing Show, Carl Cobe. Carl? Well, Andy, thank you very much. That's a, <laughs> a wonderful introduction. And uh, let me get right to the purpose for today's show. And uh, the purpose is to congratulate the show and yourself on 100 food safety interviews. I think that the AME Food Testing Show has made quite a niche for itself, has had a significant impact in the industry, and uh, I have to tell you that when I look over these 100 shows, I'm just amazed at the amount of work you've done. This is a significant body of work. Uh, there's some very significant titles, subjects, names. Uh, as I've listened to, to a number of these, uh, you have uncovered some very interesting material. So I'd like to talk about that today, but before we get into that, I'd like to say that, Andy, you have uh, done some phenomenal work in uh, the uh, testing the food in this industry. Uh, your name is widely known throughout the industry. You're known for your reputation, for your values, for your hard work, uh, for your loyalty, and uh, it's significant. And I have to say that as the chief science officer, the president of the High Sierra Group, that I'm just pleased as punch that you're with us. I'm proud that you're with us. You've done some significant work for us. And uh, you are, no doubt, uh, in my mind, and many other people that I've talked to, a true asset, not only to this company, um, to your profession, to who you are, and to the industry, um, a, a true asset. And I think you have a long way to go. I think you have much to contribute. So without any further ado, I'd like to get into talking a little bit about you. How does that sound? Well, Carl, you're turning the tables on me. I'm usually the host, but I hope and my desire today is to be the best guest on the program ever as your <laughs> inaugural interviewee. I'm, I'm sure you will be, my friend. Well, let me ask you the first question. I'd like to know something about you and your early life. Well, I was born in California raised in the Central Valley, which is known from Bakersfield to Sacramento as an agriculturally uh, based area economically, where we feed a large portion of the United States with dairy products, with fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, citrus products. Uh, we have a large uh, vineyard industry. So I grew up in, in, in that environment and my basic interests in my early life were in athletics. I participated in high school sports and uh, was a, an accomplished athlete in track and cross country. I was very interested in science at a young age, particularly chemistry, and grew up in, uh, in a business-oriented family. We had a lot of intense experiences, but they all taught me that the most important thing in a relationship with a client is to treat them better than you would treat yourself. To give people respect, to listen, and to offer them something new each time you met with them that, that really emphasized their lives and how to make their lives easier. Well, I, from everyone I've spoken to, Andy, uh, that is the case. People speak very highly of you. They talk about your integrity, your strong uh, Christian values. They talk about your knowledge, your technological background, and I'd like to know a little bit more now what you did after school. I understand you were with NASA, um, and uh, you were with uh, 
Sepiot, and if you could uh, give us a few words about that, I think that would be very interesting. Well, thank you, Carl. Yes, I've always been interested in science. As a matter of fact, when I left my bachelor's, master's, and doctorate studies at Brigham Young University, I was appointed during the Reagan administration as a what's known as a presidential management intern or a PMI program. And the deal was NASA that year picked, I think it was seven of us, and, and gave us a big speech that out of, uh, I think, 5,000 people we were selected. And at the time, uh, I had this theory of you know, industrializing space. And that was to develop pharmaceuticals in space using zero gravity. And it, it was all sounded really great until I actually got there. And, and they gave me my government-issued green desk and, you know, the pencils. And, and then they said, Andy, what we really want you to do is to help us to schedule the space shuttle launches. So I was basically issued a, a computer code and a password and basically became a spreadsheet operator. So all my visions and dreams in the most exciting agency were distilled down to being a spreadsheet operator. So I scheduled the space transportation launches and did other tasks. I did have some very interesting experiences with Code C, which is Congressional Affairs, Code B, the budget, and I worked on the program operating plan in manned space flight resources. From there, I worked in government consulting for a number of years, government agencies, primarily in scientific projects relating to the Defense Department. Then I moved back out to California in 1994, and worked in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, and I worked for a company that essentially placed engineers on a contract basis in areas that they companies couldn't solve immediately. So my assignment was to go out and find companies that were at what's known as a blockage point of technology. My specialty was biotech because I knew a little bit about it. And so I found companies that their permanent personnel their education and training experience only took the project to a certain point and they were sort of held up before they could take it to market. And they had millions invested into that point. And so I would do is assess what they needed, then go out into the market and find the talent wherever in the world it was and brought them in on an hourly basis. And I found that to be a very exciting, compelling experience. From that, one of my clients uh, had a concept in the Silicon Valley area of a capillary hyperfluid chromatography pump or HPLC pump. And so he actually, through me, we hired 25 engineers. We produced the box. This was an innovative, low-flow, high-sensitivity HPLC pump, which was capillary, very low-flow, as a precursor to either UV vis or mass spectrometry analysis. And so it was so successful, that particular pump, that he invited me to be his national sales manager, which I, I accepted, transitioned into that position. And then we sold so many units as a front end to mass spectrometry, primarily a system known as the Thermal Finnegan mass, Triple Mass Spec, that uh, when the owner of the company wanted to move it, the company down to San Diego, which was at the time a biotech uh, gold coast is what they called it, I, I wasn't going to move. I wasn't going to leave the Bay Area. So I mentioned it to the company I was giving a workshop at, a company that's called Thermo Finnegan. And at the time, our specialty was proteomics and genomics. Proteomics is the study of proteins, breaking apart them to their subcomponents, identifying up to 3,000 proteins in one sample. And then genomics is taking those proteins and identifying which specific gene set. And those are both evolving areas of interest in scientific study and instrumentation purchases at the time. So the Thermo Finnegan VP actually offered me a position where I became a global product manager for mass spectrometry. And so I worked there for a while and then I transitioned over to a company called Serox. We sold a $1 million system to take highly organic liquid waste, requa waste is what it was called, much of it radioactive. And from there, I was giving a lecture once on the proteomics. And somebody came up to me, Andy, do you know anything about polymers chain reaction and DNA analysis? I said, no. He says, okay, uh, you, you ever heard of Cepheid? 
So I worked at Cepheid for five years, primarily in life science originally, and it was a small life science company, and that's anything other than human diagnostics. We were taking the polymers chain reaction technology and using it to identify specific uh, organisms or pathogens of interest, and so I've sold about 200 of those boxes, the Cepheid Smart Cycler, to government agencies, FDA, USDA, CDC, and military outfits, and academic, which was universities in seven states, and then biotech companies, some of them very large. Primarily just taking a sample and identifying an organism based on polymer strain reaction. In 2010, uh, when Cepheid made a complete divestment of itself from life science and went completely into human diagnostics, uh, that's when I started the AME certified laboratories. That's a, that's a phenomenal background. Uh, let me ask you something. Um, what uh, was your motivation? For getting involved in the um, uh, or beginning the um, AME food testing show, what? How did you get that idea? Why? Uh, why do you feel that? Uh, why did you feel at the time it would be a, such a significant um, uh, thing to do uh, to to do for the industry? Why did you feel like it, it was even possible? What, what was that thing that triggered you to say, "I want to do this. Let's try it out"? Carl, that's a fascinating question. I actually started the show about two years ago, and at the time, I'd already been involved in discussing food safety and the implementation of DNA testing to food production quality safety managers, and I found a general, and I don't want to say this in a negative way, but I found a general apprehension of new technology. Uh, my intent was to, in a very easy to listen to, easy to use methodology or, or media to upgrade the science supporting food testing and food safety, if that makes any sense. It does. My intent, it really my does. Intent. Um, but was there a trigger event that caused you to say, let's do this and how can we benefit people through this type of media? Yes. And you know what that triggering event was? It was me presenting in front of 50 major food companies and to have them all nod their heads and say, yeah, it's a great idea, Andy, but you know what? We got insurance for that. Or, you know what, Andy, we just can't afford it. And then I walk out in the parking lot, they'll have brand new pickup trucks. I mean, you know, the newest pickup truck out there, but they're still using operating science from 50, 30 years ago. So my intent was is to very softly uh, introduce them to cutting edge technologies and different ways of doing things. Interesting, very interesting. Um, now I'm going to uh, shoot a couple of questions here, um, six or seven questions. Um, maybe we can get just a, a blast answer from you. Uh, what's right off the top of your head? What were the, some of the challenges starting to show? Well, Carl, again, another great question. What are the challenges? The challenges was my wife constantly telling me, hey, why are you doing that? It's, nobody's going to listen. Well, she was right. The first couple of months, maybe two or 300 people. Now there are thousands. And another challenge was just my time management. The other was kind of figuring out how it all worked, uh, yes. figuring out uh, who to invite figuring out and working through the details of my scripts and the best way to talk to people and invite well, what them. What a successful endeavor because I know you've got people standing in line to talk to you. I know that you have more almost 6,000 connections on LinkedIn uh, through the show. I know that one of the most recent shows I listened to about sanitation have over 1,000 listeners. I mean, this is a very, very popular medium. Um, how do you select some of these issues that, that cause so much interest in the show, Andy? Carl, you know, I spend a lot of time on computers. So when I Google, uh, I use that search engine almost exclusively, and I click on news, and then I narrow that search to food safety, food testing, the issues pop up and I read the articles, I look for the actual person who's being quoted, 
then I researched that person. And I probably invited 265 guests to be on the show. And I only have 100 interviews. Some of those are mine. And some of those, by the way, you've been a guest many times graciously. So, yes, yes you know, was, I think um, I think that uh, I know from our, our personal relationship that you had to chase down a number of these folks. Who's the most difficult that you were able to uh, snag? Great question. I think as I look back on the hundred interviews that we've had, I have tried to get the FDA officials, the actual government officials from the actually the current administration, none of them accepted. And I've tried pretty consistently. As a general rule, uh, the academic contributors have been most gracious. These are professors at universities that rarely get to talk about their projects. They have very stimulating projects, in my mind, cutting edge projects. The next group would be someone who's in a startup capacity. Uh, they've either been in a commercial group or they're a professor. Now they want to live their life as an entrepreneur. That's the most receptive group after the professors. The least receptive, obviously, the government. And somewhere in between there are lawyers and uh, people that are actually involved in the industry. They just don't want, while they're in their position, to expose themselves to any risk that they might say something wrong. But the issue is there's nothing to say wrong, in my opinion, because our community needs to upgrade its skills in food safety. And just a little bit of my philosophy here on this, Carl. My belief is that there are four categories to our industry in the professional way. First is food production. Those are the people that are worried about how many pennies does it take to get my unit of product out the door. And, we, and that's what we used to call them bean counters. But these guys are the operations guys. They have different names. But the next group are the food quality people. And they're interested in specific metrics of what's the size, shape, color, freshness. All the things they can count or assign a number or a value to that translates into a higher price that they can get for the product. Obviously, let's say a fresh good that's already spoiled. can't get anything for it. Zero. Something that's slightly spoiled, they get something but not much. And then the next group is the food safety manager. The food safety manager is someone whose primary concern is, will our product get anybody sick or kill them? And so the last is food security manager. And as you know, I do these audits. Food security is primarily the issue of, well, is anyone or has anyone contaminated our product intentionally? to make anyone sick as an act of terrorism or kill them. So as I look at those four job responsibilities, food production by and large is probably 80% of the industry that's out there. 20 or 15% are mm -hmm. the food quality. Food safety is a relatively new area. Wouldn't you agree, Carl? Yes, so very, very much so. People that are specifically trained in food safety and usually have someone with many years experience and they sort of get saddled with it. Hey, can you take care of this food auditor and walk him around and make sure he gets out of our hair for the next year? Or or someone who's just out of college, you know, got a couple of graduate degrees and a big student loan to pay off, just get that person and let them handle it. And they're sort of led around for a while. But food security is almost non-existent as a real, other than a visitor's log. There's nobody really worrying about you know, somebody terrorizing their product. Would you agree with those, Carl? It's I definitely do. I really do. I think you nail them down, um, especially regarding um, you know the the hazards involved in food safety. Um, what I'd like to do now is shift down a little bit, change gears for a moment, and ask you <laughs> a question. You may have to dig deep for this one, but. Um, which is the? Do you have a funny story about any of these interviews? Uh, anything that happened uh, during the interview, or something someone said that caught you by surprise? Well, that's a good question, and you know what? I can probably focus on that on some of our lawyers that we've interviewed. Probably the most famous lawyer is, and people that when they think about 
legal liability, Carl. What they think about is, uh, well, Andy, if I don't do this, am I going to get sued? And so the most famous lawyer that we had on the show was a gentleman who, in the show, at the end of his interview, he said, Andy, I have garnered over $600 million from food companies in my career at a, as a plaintiff's representative from companies that don't care enough to make their food safe. Now, I found that ironically humorous and tragic at the same time. I laughed and yet drew a tear. Because it's not that... I don't think the food companies are heartless. I think that they haven't focused on food safety as much. And they've assumed the risk. And does that seem crass to you, Carl? Is that ironically funny or... Does that make well, sense? Well, you know, it's, in, it, it's very sad, uh, quite frankly... I know from working with more than 12, 1,400 different uh, processors and growers throughout the country over the last 14, 15 years that I haven't found anyone who was not interested in doing food safety and doing it well. And, I, and, and when I listen to you talk about uh, this gentleman, I, I'm, I'm hurt, I guess, because um, I don't think that he has correctly reflected the, the tone I found in the industry. Um, about let's do this thing the best we can. When I first entered the in industry in 91, um, it was what can we do? How much more can we do? Let's stay in front of this. Let's stay proactive. And I still find that today in the industry. But let me change gears again and ask you another question, uh, since this is kind of an interesting topic we're on to, is what is the most, uh, what was the most unusual interview that you've had? Well, I think that's easy. I've had probably two. One was a gentleman who had developed his own food, and he called it Soylent, just recently. And he comes to mind because there's an old film with Charlton Heston. You may remember it. It was a science fiction film where in the future the world was overpopulated with humans. And, the, and it begins in the beginning opening scene. It says, farms had become a fortress, and the oceans were dead, and everyone was eating Soylent Green, which were little squares. Mm. And so this gentleman in San Francisco was an engineer, computer scientist, who was coding programming. And I'm very familiar with their tasks. These guys usually lived on donuts and Coca-Cola. But he said that he didn't have time to cook. And... He was perplexed because he didn't have very much money. They were in a startup company, and they had a bunch of programmers living in an apartment. So he just dedicated himself for a while. He studied food science on his own, and he started mixing various products to come up with a powder. It wasn't cooked. It was just add water added, stirred it together, and ate that as we called his soylent food, and he's trying to turn it into a market. The other interesting and compelling interview I've had was with a Dr. Eric Seralini in Italy and he performed tests on GMO or genetically modified organisms on rats and it was very famous for a while on tumor growth of rats and his study went on for a year and he talked about his results and I thought that was particularly compelling in light of science and its an advancement in food production and how sometimes there's a downside. At least that's what his results generally I see. Um, now, one last question, and then we'll change gears again. But if there's anybody in the, in, in the world you would want to interview, um, who would that person be? Do you have someone in mind that would be the one interview that would say, I've done it all, I've interviewed everyone, sort of a Barbara Walters moment? Actually, there is. I'm, I have probably made about 50 phone calls and sent probably 100 emails looking for an FDA official. I have several names, though, and they keep transferring me off to different offices in Maryland and, and Virginia. It's the FDA officials who are in charge of screening food in the San Diego area and Laredo, Texas, that comes from anywhere south of the border. And from my estimates and my listening, it's about 38% of all fresh produce comes from south of the border. So what are they doing in a surveillance method 
to screen the food as it comes north. And my, I don't have the data, and I've been trying. But the newspaper articles that I've read and the studies show that some of the vendors simply show a report, a piece of paper. It could be certified results from a lab. It could be just um, them doing a grab sample. They might take one or two jalapenos out of an entire trailer and simply say that the next 10 trailers are clean and just let them go through. So I've been trying, and I really love to get somebody from the FDA to say, okay, let's describe the program. Let's identify what the parameters of that program are. Because I eat food at least every day. And if 38% of it is coming from south of the border, from Chile, from Mexico, or Guatemala, all those places, I kind of want to know what the government's doing to protect me. Does that seem unreasonable, Carl? No, I think that's good. I hope you find this guy, because that's one particular interview I will certainly listen to. I now want to change gears again and, and shift up a little bit and get a little philosophical here, but... Um, I've got two or three questions regarding some interesting things only you would see that maybe you could share with us. And uh, uh, the first one is, have you noticed any common trends in these uh, interviews? Carl, yes, I have. I have broken out these interviews in my own analysis into the following categories. Again, we have 100 interviews from a wide range of professionals. Many of the professionals that I've interviewed have PhDs, doctoral degrees. They are the CEOs of companies. They are innovators. So the following categories are new food technologies. And a lot of these are so new, they're still in the laboratory or they're in a pre-market stage or they just started selling. So they've had, they have had market penetration issues. The other is outbreak news. That's outbreak of recalls or contamination outbreaks. Those sorts of interviews are very distressing to me because to me they're, they're sort of a mistake. And the mistake is that many food producers rely on the sending out of products and then at the same time sending out a sample will take several days and then, oops, sending out a notice to the whole world, we're going to do a recall. So those are very distressing interviews when I have them because it follows the philosophy of shipping and praying that there's no contamination following I see. that. I see. The next I see. category are food production. Obviously, a lot of interviews on food production, how to have better food production, food quality, food safety. Mm -hmm. Also, food sales. Mm -hmm. I had an interesting interview with a gentleman that talked about food sales, funnel development, and a food professionals' career development. I think it's very important that food pro professionals realize that they will be essentially job hopping. If it's from one company to another or within their same company, they'll be given different responsibilities. So they need to be constantly expanding the horizon, expanding, always having an inquiring mind of what's going on in the company because today they might be in food security, tomorrow they'll be in food safety, and the next day they'll be in food operations. Uh, also, there's another area in these 100 interviews is the Food Safety Modernization Act issues. It's been such a big challenge for people to get their minds around, well, what are my minimums? What are the minimums i got to do? In? I'm constantly asked that. So I've had several guests, many of them lawyers, many of them uh, laboratory managers, and then the last and probably the most distressful, other than recalls, is food litigation professionals. Most of those are lawyers. Some of them defend companies. Others attack companies. And some just give general advice to companies or insure them. So that's my summary. Well, that's interesting. Um, now, I know, um, and I, I'm sure you don't mind me saying, that you have a, a tremendous record over the last couple of years opening up um, at least 15 labs and having another uh, 5 to 10 on the books. Um, and, and these PCR laboratories have done great things to move the industry forward. I know from the trials and tribulations you've been through of uh, 
breaking new ground with a lot of people and, and talking up PCR and, and uh, doing a number of studies to, to actually prove to people what can be done through PCR. Um, you probably have some ideas regarding new techniques uh, with regard to research and development or processing enhancements that uh, you'd like to share that you see coming down the road that uh, people might want to look into or be interested in? Well, Carl, again, it's interesting that you asked me that question, and probably more than anybody in the world, you know my, my sort of soapbox that I get on top of. And my model, my ideal model, nobody's accepted it yet, but my ideal model would be for food producers to consider the five test sampling areas. First is the irrigation water that's used to grow the crop. And having done food safety audits, you know, Carl, that most food safety audit regimes only require an annual water test. To me, coming from Cepheid Life Science, having worked with EPA required methodologies, they can't just do one test on water a year. It doesn't make any sense. So that water that irrigates a product, that helps the plant grow to make the food, has to be tested on a periodic basis. Also, the product while it's in the field, that needs to be randomized, sampled in one methodology or another. The X, Y, Z pattern doesn't make a difference. And it needs to be a crap sample. Or there are new technologies which I've interviewed in the show. It's to do an aerial survey using multispectral cameras to identify areas of concern that follow on with direct sampling. That seems to be a much more efficient way. The next area would be the product as it's in a bin or a tote. If it's not a what they call a direct to harvest type operation, uh, I found that many clients are not equipped to do that type of sampling. But sampling as it's in a bin or a tote is a very rich area to capture samples. And then for those products that are taken into a processing facility, if there's any kind of wash water, that's a good sampling point because it's a good collection point. I like to look at it as 100% type sampling. If you do a periodic sampling of that water as during a production run before the cleaning cycle, that is a very rich and productive and economic way to test a product prior to its release. The last and the probably the most attractive for some people is to test the finished product on a grab sample basis. But as you've identified, Carl, you have a PhD in statistics and you amazed me one time when you said, Andy, if they have 18,000 units a day and the buyer of the product, say a major warehouse, only requires two products to be pulled, that's a point zero 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 one sample. And that's known as a grab sample versus a 100% sample of the wash water. So that, to me, and testing and getting that result prior to it leaving the facility, I think that's a revolution. And probably until my mind sees data support a different model, that's the way to go. That's what I've been encouraging people to do. And rather than shipping the product, capturing a sample, sending it off to a lab, and waiting one, two, three, four, five, ten days later to get a result, and then getting on the phones and calling people back. Exactly. Exactly. Now, regarding pathogen detection, pathogen control, surveillance models, testing regimes, what have you learned from these interviews regarding those topics? Well, Carl, I think that pathogen detection is probably sitting on everybody's mind. I remember one interview that I did about, with a lawyer, about what's going on right now with a peanut Corporation of America case. It's actually a criminal case. These are officers of a company that produce peanuts, and they conducted in-house tests for salmonella. The CEO sent out emails saying that disregard to his team, disregard the, and this is on court records, and the lawyer went through it with me, send out that product. He didn't care about the positive result. Well, as a result, many school children were made sick, and so those are pathogen detection technologies, and there are a lot of them out there. It's not just culture anymore. And if you find someone who's been out in the field for 30 years, 
they're probably honed in on the culture type mentality. But there are many types of technologies to detect pathogens and contaminants. So I think pathogen detection has taken up a lot of the interviews, and justifiably so. There are new technologies coming out all the time. Pathogen control. Uh, Carl, you have, in your high Sierra group, you have a chemical company. I've had Roy Zahn on the show just recently. Gave a very compelling discussion on the use of sterilants, cleansers, cleaners, degreasers, and that will remain one of the linchpins of food safety and pathogen control is chemical applicants. Uh, surveillance models. I think the model I just talked about, when I present it to clients, they translate it and interpret it and economically analyze it, and then they adjust it. So, Andy, this is what we're going to do. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I am perfectly fine with presenting my ideal model and then I'm a, them adjusting it. Maybe they'll use 20% or, or 40%. Uh, none of them will use 100%, but what they will do is make their products safer, and, and that's one of my major life goals. Testing regimes goes along with that. Uh, if they test two units out of 18,000 before I got there, and now they're testing 100%, that's my ideal. But if they move from two units to 500 units, that's better. Now, the antithesis of that is uh, the food scientist who tests apples and, he's, and I ask him as a consumer can I eat this apple? He says wait Andy let me take a hundred core samples out of that apple then I'll tell you if it's safe. So he takes a hundred core samples runs battery of tests might run culture, it might run PCR, it might run something else and he comes back and says Andy I'll, it's 60% safe but if you let me take another hundred core samples then I'll tell you it's 90% safe. So I let him take the other core samples and then he hands me an apple that has 200 core samples out of it and I'm supposed to eat the rest. Well that's taking it to the extreme and so I don't approve of that. But if you've just taken that apple and done some sort of non-evasive test and then given me a specificity and sensitivity in the 90% I could live with that. Does that make any sense Carl? It makes a lot of sense. Um, you know and to turn the coin a little bit when someone says you achieve a 60% value. For instance, culture testing, the best you can do is 60%. Well, what about the other 40%? What do we know about that? Are we willing to eat that other 40% that we didn't know about? And when someone gets a score of um, 92 on an on a audit, they go, wow, we're in the 90s, we're superior. Well, what about that other 8% you didn't get? What does that represent? And um, so I find what you say rather significant. And uh, in my book, audits and surveillance testing activities, we have the ability to achieve 100%. And I know myself personally that 100% is attainable. And people may say that's, um, you know, managing the audit or um, there's, there's some hocus pocus in the testing or it's statistics. It's not real life. I, I, I will. You know, I'm a man of conviction. I, I will argue with those folks till I'm blue in the face because I really believe that if you have met the standard and you've done it in such a way that it's robust, it's verifiable, then you you have achieved what we should do in the in the food industry, and that is provide safe food. Because I, I, I don't know if you know it or not, but I have a daughter that lost part of her stomach as a result of the spinach crisis from E. coli. And that was probably that 10% that somebody thought didn't matter. But it did, because I've got a daughter who doesn't eat right anymore. So to me, that little bit of something that we don't care about uh, reflects a certain number of um, people that uh, you know we're subjecting, uh, based on our reputation, to think that they're eating something correct, and it's not. In the produce industry, 15, 20 years ago, I might have said that it's hard to achieve 100%. Grab samples are the way to go. Today, I have changed my opinion quite significantly because of you, PCR, the ability to, to achieve maximum audits and demonstrate every day of the year that you are in compliance. Uh, these things now are within our reach, and we should be reaching for them. 
but my question to you as we wrap this up today, and this has been a very revealing interview, and I, I, I once again want to congratulate you on 100 of these interviews. I can't wait to get to 200 and do this again, <laughs> or 1,000, and I know you'll get there. Um, what particular uh, or, or of your opinion of this industry, um, how is this road you've been down with these 100 interviews in establishing a very significant business uh, for you and I, um, how has it changed your opinion of the produce industry? Well, the food industry in general. I, I don't know how much impact my shows have had, but I know when I go to conferences, I've given talks at state conventions, and people come up to me, so you're Andy Marino, the famous guy. And I was like, what? And, you know, it's not me. You have somebody else. But, yes, I believe my hope is that this program, as simple and humble as it is, has made a little bit more of movement, of awareness, of some managers who take the time to listen to people that know how we can improve food safety and what we have to think about. And... I don't know if you remember, Carl, I gave a talk in Ohio, and there must have been 600 farmers listening, and one gentleman raised his hand, and he said, Andy, I've been farming for 50 years. Why should I worry about food safety, uh, and why should I increase what I'm doing? And I responded very simply, three reasons. One, we have more people with AIDS, HIV, hepatitis A, B, and C than we've ever had on the planet. Your food's going out to those people. Even the one salmonella, one listeria, one subspecies of E. coli will kill them because their immune system has been reduced. The second group you need to worry about are people that are taking medications and some of these are immunosuppressant side effects. Uh, some of them are directly immunosuppressants like people that have had heart valves, replacement hips, knees, any kind of implement in their body, a pacemaker. They are taking medications so their bodies will not attack those foreign objects. So, one, again, one organism will kill them or make them significantly sick. The last group is the old, older. We have more people over 80 years old than we've ever had. I talked to somebody the other day. He says, Andy, my, my dad just died. He was a young man. I said, well, how old was he? Oh, he was 98. He was in the spring of his life. Well, the challenge is that a person born now, I just read the other day, has a life expectancy of 120. So the food that's being produced now has to be prepared for people with suppressed immune systems. And kind of the fourth category that's almost all of us in, the, in North America is that we are trying to live an aseptic life. That's the absence of any organism. And some of these organisms in our flora that are in our stomachs, in our whole organism, in our skin, all around us, they help us. They don't hurt us. They help us survive. And as we overcome them and adapt and overcome, we become more sustainable in our environment. So somebody healthy that gets one salmonella or listeria organism, uh, they're able to fight it off. They might have a vomiting session or they might have other bodily reactions, but they'll live. Others will not. So that po population of people that will not live is growing. And Carl, wouldn't you agree? that that is one of the pressures that, that food producers should be thinking about is the changing market that their products are going out to. I would agree, too. And if you look at the GFSI audits that we're doing now, a true quality audit, SQF, BRC, Global Gap, the focus is on the customer, food safety, food quality, food nutrition. Um, these subjects... Um, Say to the producer, what are you doing? You know, what what is your goal? Is it to make a profit or is it to serve the industry? And I believe that if you serve the industry, if you do things right, you will make money. And uh, I know that you have to make money. And the reason I bring that up is because no one can do these things without doing that. And that's a healthy, good objective. But in, to obtain that, we want to make sure that our first priority is food safety, food quality. Now, I have to tell you, and I'm going to give you the last word. Um, I sound a little bit like Bill O'Reilly on Fox News, but I'll give you the last word. But 
Let me just say, Andy, um, to the audience that I put you up there with a number of significant people that I've met over the last 15 years or so. And people like uh, Jim Gorney, Hank Gillis, uh, Jim Pryor with the uh, Reporters Pundit, um, people such as George Boscovich, uh, Steve Lunas, folks who made a significant dent in this industry. I think you're one of them. I think if there was a Hall of Fame, you'd be at the front door. Um, and so in saying that and thanking you for your time and wishing you the best of success and luck, and God bless you in the following 500 interviews, and I certainly hope you get that far, um, I want to say thank you from the audience and from myself for our personal relationship. And I'll give you the last word, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, bow out at this point, my friend. Well, Carl, thank you for that laudatory conclusion to our interview. I'd just like to close with one highlight of one interview. It's probably the most popular show we've ever had. And if anyone has traveled on an aircraft, and we've almost found that to be ubiquitous, you practically live on an aircraft, Carl, going back and forth from California to Wisconsin and parts in between. But was it was a show that the interviewee had done a survey of 1,300 food audit, safety audits of airline food and he found horrible, horrible circumstances in the preparation of airline food. And so I think what we, the trend is packaged foods, dried foods, shelf-stable foods. But what he found was absolutely horrible, and that's our most listened to show. And it really highlights the fact that all humans eat. As I said, I worked at Cepheid in the hospital area for many times and I've, I've helped many I've helped hundreds of hospitals literally engage PCR testing and the challenge there was to take physicians who were steeped and these are MDs that means medical doctor doctorate of medicine that were steeped in microbiology culture technology pretty much they were their education was in the 80s when I taught med school part time and so I had to teach them that polymers chain reaction worked that it helped them they didn't need to wait four days to segregate a potential contaminant of methicillin resistant staph aureus or clostridium difficile or even 70 days for tuberculosis. They can get their result in an hour. And Carl, that transition that the hospital business took was monumental. I actually helped the state of California pass a law that everyone that goes into the hospital in California has to get an MRSA screen before they're admitted. My passion there, I'm trying to bring to the food business. And that passion is, if anything, anyone that listens to this show, engage in your operations. Test prior to release. Do not release the product without having some sort of surveillance program for the benefit of everyone who's going to eat or your shareholders who will lose significant value. And Carl, I'll close by letting you tell me your experience with recalls, with contamination events, and their economic cost, because that's the big thing I hear from these operations managers, and we can't afford it. Tell me, Carl, in your vast experience with your thousands of clients, what it costs a food company to have a recall. Well, it's in the millions of dollars. I think about uh, dressing farms, DFI, this last summer with cantaloupes that was uh, inappropriately and um, and uh, wrongly fingered by the FDA, and they have since re retracted uh, the recall for, for the cantaloupes with dressing. But uh, the impact there, because there was no contamination, they were falsely accused, um, cost uh, John Dressick 4 to $5 million dollars significant reputation within the industry. Uh, it cost him um, a, a tremendous amount of money to uh, reconfigure his operation, his organization, based on what the FDA wanted. Uh, you and I both know the, the hoops we jumped through to help John out to get that thing back on track again. And the impact uh, to the community um, was a lack of trust <coughs> Excuse me, in the produce industry, in cantaloupes and melons. And there shouldn't be the lack of trust. It's much like the spinach crisis that I was significantly involved in. Um, the, to this date, uh, 
the sales of spinach are, are off by a certain amount. I, I, I'm going to guess at, at 10 to 15 percent. And so the lack of public trust is significant. And, um, and then, of course, there's no way to properly express um, the illness and loss of lives. That's just horrible and tragic. Um, you can't put a number on that. You can't equate that to anything but uh, just a very sad, sad event. And so the, the impact is industry-wide because anybody who produces spinach, anybody who produces melons um, is impacted, and that's not right. And so you find that people are people will move away from fresh produce, and that's the worst thing you can do because if you talk about us becoming an aseptic society, uh, that's the quickest way to move into that Perel sort of environment that uh, we shouldn't be in. I I believe that we need to eat more produce. We need to eat it more often, and we need to eat more varieties, and uh, not not for any other reason but to strengthen our, our immune system and help us grow healthier and stronger with better brains and do better things. So with that, Andy, I'm going to say thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, I, I certainly enjoyed every minute of this interview. And I wish you once again uh, Godspeed, good luck, and I can't wait to talk to you at, uh, at the number 200 and number 500. So thank you, sir, and, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Carl. I look forward to you being a host of your own interviews on the AMA Food Testing Show. I wish you a good thank day. Thank you, sir.